you have two replies due. So I want enough time for everybody to get their original discussion up so people can read what you wrote. So please get that original discussion done tonight. Please, um, please. Professor, for that discussion, I think the link for the respiratory video, I think it doesn't work. Because okay. I, I tried last night and there's a... Oh, thank you. Okay, I will look at that after class. Thank you. We're gonna begin dissecting today and then um, your practical is on, I believe, November 9th. Um, it will be in person. There'll be stations of fetal pigs dissected with structures pinned. You just need to know the location of the structures for the practical. So it'll be fetal pig stations, heart model stations, and torso stations and or from the torso could be organs that are just set out and you need to know what they are. So the next two weeks, you will in lab be working on dissecting the pig, studying the pig, the heart, and the torso. That's what your time in lab is for. So today we'll open up the pigs and then on Tuesday we'll begin. I'll do like a little tour to get you acquainted. You certainly can begin studying at any time. The heart models, there's one that has little like button pins on it and there's a key that tells you like what you should be studying on the heart. One of the torsos is all pinned. Um, I also last night put up study materials for the practical for lab 30. So you should see that in your modules as well. There's a PowerPoint that has a picture of something the next slide is it labeled and the next slide is its function. So to give you an idea of what you should be studying, everything is in there. Everything that you could possibly be quizzed on for the practical is in that PowerPoint. I have a PowerPoint and then I have it on PDF if you can't open PowerPoint. So I have both forms of it. There's also a checkoff sheet. So it's kind of like an objective sheet where you can go through, it'll say what you could be quizzed on for the pig, for the torso and the heart. So that's kind of a nice thing. Um, I will print some out for next week and have them available in lab. So if you wanna start like quizzing yourself and go through and do a little check off to check in and see what you know as you quiz yourself, it might be a helpful tool. So that's up there as well. I'm trying to think what else. I don't know. I think your next exam is like November 11th, which seems a while away, but it's going to come fast since we're in unit four already. Make sure you're starting to work on your study guide objectives. This unit is a lot of information. So let's pick up. Anybody questions about anything? to talk about a negative feedback system that regulates red blood cell numbers. So if you remember, the red blood cells are also called erythrocytes, more scientific name for them. Your body can keep track of how many erythrocytes you have produced in your body. So that if you have a low number of erythrocytes being produced by the bone marrow, it's going to trigger, trigger a negative feedback loop. And so what we mean by, we haven't gotten to feedback loops and we'll get them into more detail in the next unit when we talk about the endocrine system and specifically in regard to the reproductive system. But a feedback loop, it's one of the ways that things are regulated in our body. And it's like a checkpoint system that our body can monitor things, important processes, like the amount of red blood cells, like your body temperature, and it can trigger a series of events. One thing leads to the next thing, leads to the, ne leads to the next thing. And then all the way back to getting you to that set point of having, for example, here, 
the right amount of red blood cells, or if we're talking about body temperature, there's a series of events that get you back to the right body temperature. When this series of events goes back and gets you to the set point, we call that a negative feedback loop because it's one loop and then you're back to the start. This is the most common monitoring system in our body in terms of feedback loops. There is positive feedback loops in our body. They are not very common because what happens in positive feedback loops is it goes around a series of events, gets to the beginning and it says, uh oh, we're not at our set point. Let's go through the loop again. We're not at our set point, let's go again. We're not at our set point, let's go again. That takes a lot of energy because each of those steps is, this step triggers the production of something else, which triggers the production of something else, which triggers the production of something else. Each of those things that are produced takes a lot of energy to get you back to the set point. In positive feedback, it's going round and around and it's saying more of each, more of each, more of each. One example of that is childbirth is that when the woman is pushing out the baby, it says, okay, oh, we're not there yet. The baby's not out, let's go again. Baby's not out, baby's not out. That's why it's very painful for women and why it's very exhausting because all of these steps keep going and going and each step is an exhausting or it exhausts energy. And so the woman is putting a lot of energy into making these positive feedback loops go until the baby is out. Sometimes it takes hours, usually tens of hours, sometimes a couple days for these loops to keep going and going and going. So um, that might trigger a little kind of visual in your mind that this is, that's why a feedback loop, a positive feedback loop is a lot of energy and why you don't have a lot of those happening in your body. So with the negative feedback loop here with the red blood cells is there's a monitoring system to see that your blood is producing an ex enough red blood cells because you need oxygen carried by your red blood cells to break down your food to make your energy more useful. So remembering that the process of cellular respiration, the process of taking energy in the form of your food, proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, breaking them down with the use of oxygen to produce ATP energy, the critical factor in getting the highest metabolic output for that is using oxygen. If you remember back in evolution, we talked about anaerobic respiration Anaerobic respiration means without oxygen, the ability to break down your food, not using oxygen, the output of the ATP is very small in comparison. It's two ATP per glucose or per cycle. With oxygen, it's 32. So using oxygen, we way more efficiently break down our energy. So why would our body let us go into anaerobic it won't, I mean, it'll, it will, sorry, it will temporarily, but it's going to try and get us back to aerobic respiration. And this is what this feedback loop is for. The main guiding factor is this hormone called erythropoietin. Erythropoietin is produced by the kidneys. The kidneys are detecting the amount of red blood cells the kidneys are a filtration system for your body. It's like a checkpoint and seeing that things are going well within the blood. One of the checkpoints is the kidneys are looking to kind of count the amount of red blood cells. And so if the kidneys detect there's a low amount of red blood cells, which means a low amount of oxygen being carried in the blood, then it is going to trigger the release of erythropoietin. Erythropoietin goes through a series of steps that contacts the bone marrow, goes through the blood, contacts the bone marrow, and it says to the bone marrow, hey, 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 up the production of the red blood cells because we're a little low. And this will hopefully in a cycle stop, but maybe these negative feedbacks occasionally will go through a couple to get it going. Eventually, 
you get to the normal set point of the proper amount of red blood cells and then you stop with that. So here's an example graphically of that negative feedback loop that if you have an oxygen deficiency, the kidneys are going to stimulate the production of erythropoietin. Erythropoietin is going to travel through the blood. It's going to go to the bone marrow. The erythropoietin is going to stimulate the bone marrow to create more red blood cells, which eventually will then restore the amount of oxygen being carried in the blood. And then it's going to stop this whole process. So once you get the restoration of this, production of oxygen, it's gonna say, uh-uh, we're good. Everybody's good. No more erythropoietin, we're fine. So how is this used in athletic events to up your game, so to say? So really famous example is Lance Armstrong. He was a world-class cycler, won the Tour de France many, many times, and one of the things that he did, and he was accused and um, proved that he was doing blood doping. And so it sounds like, oh, he's doing some kind of drugs. Well, erythropoietin is naturally produced by our body. So here's a really clever way of getting that athletic advantage because if you get injections of erythropoietin, you can up the amount of oxygen that you produce, which makes it a bit easier as you're doing some kind of heavy-handed type of athletic um, activity to produce more oxygen, thus break down your food more efficiency, which keeps that whole system of fueling your body and especially those muscles who are working overtime to fuel them to higher efficiency than if you have kind of the regular amount of erythropoietin. And then you're gonna switch back and forth in your cells between anaerobic respiration and aerobic respiration. And so if you have that kind of switching over often to anaerobic respiration, you're gonna need more input of food or breakdown of nutrients in your body. Whereas if you stay more with higher amounts of erythropoietin into aerobic cellular respiration, you can keep fueling at a higher efficiency than someone who doesn't have that advantage. And so it allows you to perform at a higher level. It's hard to detect this. So that's why for many years, as you, as especially Lance Armstrong went through these events, they couldn't detect that he was blood doping with erythropoietin because everybody has it in their blood. So kind of an interesting thing. All right, so we're gonna come back to this idea of needs for erythropoietin in a little bit when we talk about diseases of the heart. Three types of blood vessels in our body. You've got the larger vessels, and this is just, again, a very generic, just like this unit, we generically go through all of the systems. So it gives you a little idea for when you take more advanced classes, you'll be like, oh yeah, I kind of remember the basics of that. So we have larger vessels like arteries and veins, Remember that arteries go away from the heart. They carry blood away from the heart. Smaller branches or medium-sized branches are called arterioles. So you have your arteries, which are larger. They branch into smaller branches called arterioles. The veins and venules bring blood to the heart. So here we have veins, smaller branches called venules. One of the things that I want to point out between the arteries and the veins is that the arteries help to maintain our blood pressure. They have a larger amount of muscle underneath the walls of the arteries so they can contract harder. That's why when you're doing the blood pressure, like you did the other day, the detection is the contraction of muscles. And then, you know, if you think about the heart, right? So the heart's here, and every time the heart beats, if you didn't have the assistance of this muscular system within the arteries and the arterioles to continue to contract, how would you one heart beat? One contraction, get blood all the way down to the feet, all the way out to the tips of the arm, all the way up to the head. 
So this is really critical, and not only the health of your heart in terms of your circulatory system, but the health of the muscles within the arteries and the arterioles to continue to take that heartbeat, get that signal, and keep pumping the blood throughout your body. The veins bring blood, so they're gonna bring blood out to the body. The veins are gonna bring it back to the heart. And the way, so the, if, if you look at the difference between the thickness of the muscle in the arteries and the arterioles, and the thickness of the muscle in the veins and the venules, it is far different. It looks almost like three times more in the arteries. And so the way that the veins can keep the blood pumping from the tips of your toes tips of your fingers, top of your head, back toward the heart, is they have these valves within. And these valves are kind of like little gates that'll keep it push. So the valves will keep it pushing periodically back in the right direction. So you don't need as much muscle within the veins and the venules. So they have two distinct systems of helping to contract and push in the right directions. The other great thing about valves, if you remember from the other day when we talked about the AV valves and the semilunar valves, is that valves keep it pushing in the right direction and prevent the backflow of blood because you don't want deoxygenated blood flowing backward. You want to keep pushing toward the lungs so that you can release that carbon dioxide. It can diffuse out and you can get more oxygen in your body. So very interesting distinct systems between the two. Where, so sorry, I'm gonna get back. In the middle, so you've got the veins and the venules, arteries and arterioles. Where they meet at the cellular level, these little tiny branches that are one cell thick are called capillaries. So this is a really cool image that you can see. Red blood cells, again, remembering that 99% of your blood cells are red blood cells. That's why you see it mostly in this image here. And they're only about one cell wide. So remember the sickle cells that had those weird pointed shapes on the ends that they could easily, if this is so thin, easily harm the capillaries, especially in places where you have turns. These are your smallest, thinnest blood vessels. They are thin so that they can be permeable, allow the diffusion of gases, oxygen to the cells, carbon dioxide out of the cells, as well as other small atoms and molecules, ions in and out of the cells. critical to being thin for gas exchange. Oxygen and carbon dioxide are very, very small. So again, arteries, arterioles, veins, venules meet in the middle at the capillaries. So let's talk about heart issues. So I'm sure you've heard about some of these. We're gonna give you a little bit more detail to build on. So the first one that I've mentioned before is hypertension. Hypertension is a fancy way of saying high blood pressure. When you start getting into the 130s, you go to the doctor, they probably test you again, they probably do your blood pressure again, and then they monitor you. They like to keep your blood pressure low in your body because what it does is it constricts your arterioles. If you have less volume, sorry, if you have the same volume, so let's say you have an even six liters of blood, but now your arteries and your arterioles, which are like this, are constricted meaning that they are contracting more because you're hypertensive, you have less area to send the same volume of blood around. So it's like you're moving and you have a doorway and you have this large couch 
that doesn't fit through the doorway. But you know, when you're moving, you're like, I'm gonna get this through because you're not used to this house or this apartment. And so you're trying to maneuver it. And what usually happens when you try and get something very large through a doorway that clearly is not big enough? Do you damage the couch and the doorway? Yeah. So when you're trying to shove that volume of blood through a constricted area, you are going to do some damage here. So that's why we don't want people to have high blood pressure. The heart is a muscle. What that does to the heart muscle is the heart muscle is like, well, I still got to pump the blood, so I am going to work harder. When you exercise your muscles, do they get bigger when you exercise them? They do. So if you are putting more strain and exercise to your heart, the heart gets bigger in size. What that can cause, that extra pressure on the heart, that extra exercise can cause you to have pains in your heart called angina. So at the beginning of hypertension, sometimes people will go in and say, you know, oh, I'm starting to get these like pains right here. And I say, oh, oh, that's a sign of hypertension. That's not good. One of the other accelerators of another disease of the heart of hypertension is that it will add to atherosclerosis, which is hardening of the arteries. And we're gonna to get to that next. So a lot of times what we see with these heart issues is that one contributes to another. If you keep pushing, right? We said that if you take that couch and you're trying to push it through that doorway, eventually, you're going to do some damage. One of the damages that can happen is a rupture that can cause internal bleeding within your body. If you have internal bleeding, you have a rupture of a blood vessel in your head, they call that a stroke. Depending on where that blood vessel ruptures depends on how much damage can be done. So it really depends on, is it in a part of the brain that doesn't have as important of a function as another part of the brain? It might minimize the destruction, the damage there. And so it's all just kind of luck of the draw. Ways that you can reduce hypertension. So if you go to the doctor and they say, well, you have hypertension. What your doctor should begin with is say, oh, well, you're a little overweight. Let's get that weight down. While we know that's really hard for most people, it can be done. Let's change your diet, make it more healthy. Let's reduce your salt. Oftentimes people who have hypertension are eating more processed foods which have a higher amount of salt content in them. Just for, salt is, one of many preservatives in food. So let's say, let's eat more whole foods, more natural foods. The other one, let's reduce your stress. That's nearly impossible to do, right? So um, one of the things that they turn to, and it's always funny when, you know, like a doctor, like, just lose weight and reduce stress and change your diet to a completely healthy diet. Those are a large scale changes to take on at once. So what they do is usually, and this is one of the, um, like Lipitor, for example. No, not Lipitor. No, 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 no. That's not for Chris. I can't think of the name of the drug. But there's classes of drugs that are used specifically for hypertension. They're sold a lot, especially in the United States where we don't eat such a natural diet. And they'll say, okay, I'm going to prescribe this drug to you to help too. The way that the drugs work is they reduce the volume of water in your blood so that you have less blood volume. Is it a good thing to dehydrate your blood? No, right? So that's the way that this is treated. It is really important for someone who has hypertension to work on these things, which are again, really hard to do. If you have hypertension in your family and you are not overweight and you eat pretty healthy, try and manage your stress. 
but watch this. Try hard to watch this. So imagine stroke. Hypertension is not the only cause of stroke. There are many causes of stroke. So a stroke is a rupture of a blood, breast, blood vessel in your brain. That sounds scary, right? If it's caught quickly, you can minimize the effects of the rupture. The deprivation of oxygen to the brain is critical in causing damage. The brain cells need oxygen. They need nutrients. They need to have the waste products taken away from the metabolism of your food, as well as taking away carbon dioxide. Okay, I like this. Stroke is usually caused by, check out this list. Okay, atherosclerosis can add to it. An embolism, where you get a clot somewhere in your body, and then it travels somewhere else, and it blocks somewhere else. So if hypertension is causing damage to your blood vessels, and you have a blood vessel, if you remember a little bit about the platelets, the platelets float around, they're pieces of mega karyocyte cells, and the platelets float around, and they look for uneven surfaces within your blood cells, and when they see an uneven surface, they're going to shoot out fibrin to make that spider web and they're going to capture cells, contract that area, and try and heal that uneven surface. So what can happen to that clot is that clot can naturally get broken down in your body, or if the fibrin releases, that clot can travel somewhere else, like the brain. Could be microangiopathy. This is a small artery disease. Not super common in my like 15 years of teaching here. I've had one student who had this. And so for him, he was like very, very smart, wanted to go into medicine to specifically study this. But he was only taking two classes at a time. And he was like, college is gonna take me a little longer because I have to manage my stress. So there are you know, ways we can kind of deal with things like that. But it's hard because you're like, I wanna get done with college in four years and I wanna get done with this and this time. And so we're just like a lot of pressure to not slow down in life. Occlusion, meaning blocking of the vessels in the brain. Hypertension, we talked about. AVM, arterial venous malformation. It's just the not proper formation of blood vessels in the brain as you're a fetus. Another thing that has to be monitored. A cerebral aneurysm. So I wanna just talk about an aneurysm real quick. So if you have a blood vessel and it is like this and you have pressure on that blood vessel and it could be caused by many things but um, one can be um, hypertension and so that pressure could start to cause this to bow out and get thinner and over time bow out more and get thinner and get thinner and when this ruptures, it's an aneurysm. Aneurysms more common in people with hypertension. And we'll talk in a little bit about other situations where it's more common. You could have a stroke from a brain injury, fall when you're a kid, playing sports, get in a car accident. When you get older, you fall. Head injury, brain injury depending on which are, and or both, right? And then congenital artery defects, again, something more genetic. The most common in these. So a lot of situations that stroke can cause. Oh, sorry, and prematurity, which prematurity will go along with congenital artery defects and sometimes AVM and um, arterial malformations. So next issue. Atherosclerosis is hardening of the arteries. Kind of in summary, what it does is that you're eating a high cholesterol diet, usually containing, we're gonna call it bad cholesterol. When you have too much cholesterol, 
your body tries to metabolize it. We can metabolize more easily plant-based cholesterols than animal-based cholesterols. Animal-based cholesterols will get stuck and shoved underneath the walls of your arteries because your body's kind of like, eh, I don't know what to do with this. And instead of just kind of like putting it on your butt as fat, it sticks it underneath the walls of your arteries. Causes your arteries to get harder because that fat over time gets more dense and drier and thicker and it unites elasticity of your blood vessels. It starts to like, ugh, it's gotta try and squeeze around that hard fatty pocket and your blood vessels don't pump as well. So this is what it looks like. Those fatty deposits are called plaques. They will be deposited between the wall of the artery and the muscle layer. So they can do tests, they can look at and see where you have these deposits of plaques. The most dangerous places to have these deposits of plaques are on the coronary arteries that service the heart muscle and cells itself. Here you can see a branch of the coronary artery and you can see all of those little plaques that are starting to build up in there. The plaques are made of LDL cholesterol. This is low density lipoproteins. This is what we would equate to, sorry, this is what we would equate to the bad fat. HDLs are your good fat. HDLs are fats that are traveling around your body caused by eating plant material and exercise. So the LDLs, if you get too much, if you keep having too much, Again, your body's like, I don't know what to do with this. I'm not going to put it on your butt or in your gut. I'm going to stick it underneath the walls of your arteries. So you get these fatty deposits and you start to get the fat layer. Eventually, like I said, what can happen is this can get kind of like dried out and brittle and eventually cause a break on the inner wall of your artery or your arterial thus causing your platelets to go up. Oh, here's an uneven surface. And so they're going to shoot out that fibrin and they're going to make a clot. And so here is where it's a little bit harder because whereas a clot can natural processes get broken down, if this is already occluded or smaller because this area is bigger, it can get stuck. If it gets stuck for too long, you don't have a flow of blood to the heart and it can cause you to have issues. And we'll talk about those in a little bit too. So HDL cholesterol, this is your good cholesterol. Your body knows what to do with this. Genetically, some of us have a good genetic predisposition to knowing better what to do with our cholesterol. Some of us eat better than others. We're seeing accelerated rates of this now because we drive through a lot. And in drive throughs we're eating more animal-based meats or proteins. When you have a lot of LDL, the low density lipoproteins, the quote unquote bad cholesterol, it's gonna attract all kinds of issues to one area, right? You're going to get the platelets, they're gonna shoot out fiber and they're gonna make a clot. Your white blood cells are gonna come and try and deal with the situation as well. And that's just gonna make that area worse. So you have a cascading effect where your body is trying to help it and it actually hinders the process a bit too. Your body also has other mechanisms of trying to deal with this kind of brittleness is they're going to add an extra layer, an extra cap. And so if in this you're already got this fatty core and now you're going to add a cap to it, all you're doing is you're making this smaller and smaller. Yeah, so when we try and solve this in the body, it can add more issues.
So this is what an unhealthy artery or arterial looks like. You can see how dry, brittle this has become, these fatty deposits. And here, you can see the plaque here. You can see cracks and uneven surfaces all over the place. The most serious consequences of atherosclerosis are heart attack and stroke. So how do you deal with atherosclerosis? Your doctor is going to say things like, do you smoke? Smoking accelerates atherosclerosis. If you're overweight, you might have other issues like diabetes. Diabetes can accelerate atherosclerosis. You know, it's um, especially in the United States, one major disease can add to many other major diseases. And so one of them, like obesity, for example, is one that can start to branch off and cause you to have all kinds of diseases. Diabetes is another one. Atherosclerosis, they all kind of like, you start to get this great storm of issues when you have one major disease in your body. Exercise, they're gonna say, lose weight, exercise, eat more plant-based products, and then they're gonna probably prescribe to you Lipitor. Yeah, come in. Uh, sorry for the previous point, who makes the cat exactly? What makes it? So, I'm not exactly sure what makes the cap. I believe the white, the immune system is a factor in generating that cap, but I'm not specifically sure. That's a good question. You'll learn more when you take AMP. And again, really careful if you have a genetic predisposition to this. My father's cholesterol was 574 when they started treating or started testing for cholesterol back in the, I think it was like the 80s. So you should have healthy, you should be under 200. <laughs> now granted, there's a big genetic predisposition there, but there's also issues like my dad thinks drinking Coke and coffee are drinking water. But both of those are diuretics, which make you dehydrate faster because of the caffeine content. Um, so, you know, that's an issue. Other, eating a lot. My dad was a butcher, so brought home a lot of meat. Um, likes his sweets. Never, never an overweight guy, though, but had all these other things and was very busy working, so he didn't have a lot of time to exercise. Um, so Lipitor brought it down, but even that brought it down into the high 200s. And so he's like something always been working on his whole life. Um, for me, since I knew I have that genetic predisposition, my cholesterol's always been higher, but kind of thankfully, I just was never a person who liked meat. So it's funny, as my father was a butcher bringing home meat, I would take the meat and I would like hide it in places under the table or spit it into the napkin. Cause I was like, this is gross. Um, and so for me, I've always had, you know, like I would hover somewhere around the 200s. Uh, one of the things that has helped me is that I've always been athletic. And so my HDL cholesterol was always very high in that count. So that's like, there's things that you look at. There's a couple of things when you look at your cholesterol, they'll look at three factors, your HDL, your LDL, how much those together amount to they're gonna focus on your HDL. How much do you have? If you have a high amount, the ratio of HDL to LDL will kind of give you a pass a little bit on that number. Um, and then your triglycerides, which your triglycerides focus more on how much sugar do you consume? And then sugar over time can get created into or changed into cholesterol. So those are three factors. So like my son has been getting tested since he was a baby because his cholesterol and my husband's parents both have high cholesterol issues. And interesting, none of them overweight. So a lot of it's diet and genetics and lack of exercise. Um, 
So my son exercises a lot. Um, but we just went and got it tested, it was lower, but his triglycerides were two and a half times the normal amount, which said he's very sensitive to carbohydrates. So I was like, oh, dude, we really gotta, and not just, and it's interesting because he's like me where he doesn't like meat so much. So he's, on a, he's a high carb guy, but we gotta watch that. She even said like too much pasta, bread, which are his main things, uh, we've got to get more protein in. So just, you know, watch your family history and make sure you're trying to fix that now. Next issue, heart attacks. So we've mentioned this a few times. A heart attack, sometimes like if you see it on a TV show or you know, those of you who work in the hospitals might hear them call it a myocardial infarction, an MI, an AMI, acute myocardial infarction. One of your coronary arteries is blocked and you don't have enough service of the blood to the heart. When the heart muscle is deprived of oxygen, nutrients, can't get the waste products taken away, the carbon dioxide taken away, those cells quickly begin to die. Rapid treatment can really decrease the effects of a heart attack. So things like if somebody starts to have symptoms of a heart attack, they're getting pain, especially in their left arm, angina, shortness of breath, dizziness, all of these things together, get them an aspirin. And aspirin will thin the blood and allow a little bit, hopefully, of blood flow to get past the block in the heart. An administration of oxygen, as well as calling an ambulance and getting a professional there to help them. But that, just that quick amount of like an aspirin can help a lot. A few ways to help. If they detect someone is starting to have a major blockage, but it's not completely blocked yet, there's a few different options that they can do. So one is, so this is what it would look like, right? You start to get that occlusion of that plaque inside of the artery, the arterial. They can go in, they usually come in like through the groin or through the leg and they will thread a little tiny machine, like a little tiny wire with a little tiny drill on the end. They will guide it all the way up to that blockage and drill it away. So that's one thing that they can do. Another thing they can do is again, they'll use a little tiny wire with a clamp on it that's holding a coil so this they will have compressed until it gets to the area. And so they're using machines to detect where they're at. And once they get to that area, boing, you can open it up. Kind of cool, right? They call that a stent. So if you've heard the term stent, that's what it does. It's a little coil that can open that area up. The other thing that they can do, again, tiny wire with a balloon and the balloon is deflated, and once it gets into that area, inflate it, it will hopefully break this up a bit and allow that area to open up. So these are kind of things that they know somebody is on their way. What can we do to prevent this? It's made of Kevlar, so it's a material that's not going to get rusty. It can remain in the body. Yeah, yeah, you'd think like, <laughs> You don't want something rusty in there either. Yeah, yeah, good thought process. If somebody has a heart attack and one of those gets occluded, one of the coronary arteries gets totally blocked, and that means that this part is useless, it's all occluded, all blocked up, what they're gonna do is they're going to do a bypass they're going to, so bypasses, there might be a single bypass, a double bypass, triple, quadruple bypass. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna go in the leg and they're gonna take an area of vein out. And then they're gonna bypass that block to service the rest of that branch. Depending on how many bypasses you need, you could have two, three, four. That vein, they connect it up to the aorta, and then they bypass the blocked area to the next area that is open and free. One of the things they have to do with 
when they undergo bypass, when someone undergoes bypass, because the heart is here, it's hard to get to the heart because you've got the lungs, which have ribs, and you have this, feel this right here, the sternum, they have to cut that open. So they take a drill and they cut that in half, they open up the lungs, the ribs, not the lungs, the ribs, they open the ribs, the rib cage, to get to working on the heart. So the recovery of this is a long road because then they have to suture this back together, use kind of like glues and materials to get it back together. This has to heal, it's pretty thick. And then get that person moving right away, right after surgery, so um, as soon as possible. It's a very, very, very long recovery, very difficult recovery. Plus the fact that you've got to recover your leg too from where the veins have come up. Genetic disease, heart failure, called dilated cardiomyopathy. The heart becomes stretched out and weakened. Hypertension can lead to this. One of the things they're also beginning to detect as a lot more people are suffering from anxiety, anxiety can cause a lot of stress, especially to the heart, and can cause down a long road heart failure. Can, anxiety can lead to the, the killing of your heart cells. So this is a very, very new area of research. If your heart's not pumping appropriately, you're not getting enough oxygen to break down your nutrients in your cells. So it can have a, a big effect on the rest of the body. Typically, what people, um, the effect of it is people are exhausted all the time because there's just not enough getting out to the body. The cells aren't getting fed universally in the body. One of the things that also happens as a offshoot of having heart failure, the beginnings of heart failure, is that water begins to accumulate in the lungs. And so when you have water, the diffusion of gases into and out of your lungs is much harder. And it's essentially like your body begins to drown. So a lot of people who are in the stages, early stages of heart failure, will have a really hard time breathing, they'll have a heavy breath, because there's not as much open volume within the lungs themselves. It's found in both sexes, both sexes. It's more common in males than females though. It can happen to people of all ages. Middle-aged men, we see it more often in. We see it more often in alcoholics and drug addicts. Especially cocaine and meth seem to have a bigger effect. Diseases that we have helped to cure with vaccines that cause infections of the heart have lessened now, so we don't see that as much. The statistics are very high. And it's very hard to recover of. So let's talk about some of the, the symptoms. So as I mentioned, shortness of breath, low activity, any exertion of, of energy is very difficult. Over time gets worse, often also leads to anemia. One way that they might begin to detect heart failure is if you go in and they see elevated levels of erythropoietin. So if you're somebody who's like, I'm only short of breath, they're going to probably test your erythropoietin, see if it's elevated in your blood and then go from there. Treatment, you blood dope the person, right? So this treatment of extra erythropoietin will help them to manufacture more red blood cells and help to get more energy and oxygen onto the cells. So here's a good way of using erythropoietin. The cure is heart transplant. It's just a progressive disease. So do they extract the oxygen from the blood or how do they like blood? How do they
inject it with one item. Oh, to inject you with liquid? Yeah, yeah they would give injections of it. So yeah, lots of just statistics here. Heart transplants are very um, difficult in finding a match. Kidneys are a lot easier to find a match for. Heart and lung transplants are much harder. So sometimes people are on the transplant list for a, a very long time. And um, if somebody gets a heart transplant, they have very good recoveries from it and a, a longer life outlook. Um, there's been a lot of people, if you, you know, Google heart disease, um, heart disease, uh, uh, heart failure, sorry, heart failure, you can read all kinds of really great inspiring stories of people who've gotten heart transplants, run marathons, and do all these things to bring attention to the disorder. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the lymphatic system. So we're onto our second system. This one has a huge relationship with the heart. Disorders of the lymphatic system will cause things like elephantiasis as well as the mumps or tonsillitis as well. Who wants tonsillitis? We'll talk about the mumps too. So circulatory system, it's not just about blood. There's, remember, other things that are in the plasma. There's also white blood cells, immune system. So we're going to see a lot of other systems that are closely related to the circulatory system. So we're gonna start with the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system has specific parts. The lymphatic system is composed of a network of lymph capillaries and larger vessels. Because of the natural process of diffusion, we have all kinds of atoms and molecules that are moving from high concentration to low concentration through the process of diffusion in our bodies. One of the things is water will be moving from high concentration in our blood to low concentration in the areas that surround our tissues and cells. So we can't just have water accumulate there and just sit there. Something's got to get that out of those what they call interstitial areas back somewhere else and back into our blood. So that's what the lymphatic system does, is in those pockets where water accumulates between cells, it's gonna pick up that water and bring it back to the heart. The other thing that it does is it has lymph nodes, which works in close conjunction with the immune system. Some of the tissues in your body are lymphocyte rich, which means that they have a big immune system component, like your tonsils, for example your spleen. As well as we'll talk about the thymus too. So those are the major parts of the lymphatic system. Lymphatic systems all over your body, right? So anywhere that you have circulatory vessels, especially the capillaries are very thin, water is going to diffuse out into cellular, outside cellular, outside cellular areas. And so you have this network just like you do of the circulatory system. And then you have other major areas like the spleen, the thymus is on top of the heart, as well as your tonsils. So there's three major functions of the lymphatic system. One is to get that water fluid back into the circulatory system. Oh, I'm gonna go through each of these individually, sorry. Okay, so let's talk about the connection between the two. So wherever you have the network of capillaries, which is our blood vessels, I should just say, you're gonna have an opposing vessel of lymph. So they're all interconnected together. One network helps the other network. The lymph capillaries are very small and thin, just like blood capillaries or circulatory capillaries. They're going to be very thin. Water is a small molecule. 
So to diffuse across, they're going to have to be thin also. Like the veins, they have one-way valves that are going to help push the fluids back toward the heart. Like you saw with the picture of elephantiasis, where there's an issue of water accumulation, there's some issue with those lymph vessels not pushing the water in the right direction. So really important that nothing dead ends into an area of your body and just starts to bloat that area and swell it. Eventually, the lymph capillaries branch to larger vessels and larger vessels. Those larger vessels are eventually going to merge with the heart. So here's an area where you see a venule and an arterial, and in the middle you see the blood capillaries. Process of diffusion is going to cause leaks from the capillaries, and then you'll have the lymphatic capillaries to pick that up. So in this particular function, let's take a look at some issues that people may suffer. We typically don't see this in our area of the world because we have good water filtration. We also don't have as many mosquitoes and mosquitoes carrying things like nematodes, little tiny roundworms, little microscopic roundworms where a mosquito could land on you, bite you, and slip this nematode or roundworm into you. What can happen is that someone can get elephantiasis. Sometimes people call it elephantitis, but it's actually elephantiasis. So here you can see lower extremity suffering, maybe a little bit even in the major parts of the body and that arm there, but swelling of the tissues. So all caused by a roundworm called Wucheria bancrofti. Like malaria, different kind of roundworm or nematode, transmitted by mosquitoes. When the mosquito bites you, sucks your blood, this is injected into the circulatory system. So this is microscopic. These roundworms have the instinct to colonize the lymphatic vessels. And so they'll find an area, colonize, meaning that they're gonna live there, they're gonna reproduce, reproduce more, 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 and block up the lymphatic vessels. Can cause again, things here, uh, issues like this. So once they colonize an area, they can scar up, cause blockages and scars within the lymphatic vessels and no longer allowing your body to drain off that excess fluid. Can be found in arms, but usually in extremity and typically in a leg. Is it true in that particular area of white swelling Do they completely shut off? They don't work anymore? No, usually the, you know, the body responds in, in very amazing ways. Um, usually the lymphatic vessels will start to kind of grow and help. But if the parasite's faster than that process, and depending on like how far they go and treatments that they get um, to minimize the symptoms of it, it all is kind of like a trying to get ahead of the issue. But the lymphatic system usually will start to kind of start, try to grow more. Same thing can happen with heart disease, especially when you're talking about atherosclerosis, the um, coronary arteries of the heart, if there is a blockage, sometimes will start to grow new branches to try and um, alleviate the pressure of that. So not always fast enough to be a cure, but help a little bit. Yeah, good question. Um, 
Okay, I just wanna mention that treatment for this is typically uh, chemo. That it's usually a couple years of high amounts of chemicals that target specifically fast growing cells like these roundworms. But also again, chemo, because chemo targets high fast growing cells, there's a lot of other issues when someone has chemo, like um, fast growing cells are hair, right? Eyelashes, eyebrows, your hair on your head, hair on your body, but also fast growing cells in our body. We're gonna talk about the digestive system has fast growing cells because we release hydrochloric acid and a lot of other enzymes regularly. It breaks, those cells break down quickly and are replaced quickly. So a lot of digestive system issues as well but in third world countries where they might not even be able to, the community might not be able to afford water filtration, affording chemotherapy for a couple of years is nearly impossible. So second function of the lymphatic system is to transport fats from the small intestine to the bloodstream. There's a whole interesting process. I'm not gonna get into too many details about this, but essentially there's a process of the fats being diffused out of the digestive system to smaller and smaller and smaller molecules, and then eventually small enough that they can be picked up by the lymphatic vessels and eventually brought back to the heart. So here's where that kind of relationship with having atherosclerosis is important to think about that when you have a high amount of animal fat and your body doesn't really know what to do with it, one of the first places fats are brought and why your coronary arteries are very susceptible to having or causing atherosclerosis is because those fats are brought right to the heart immediately. It's a really fascinating whole process. So I'm not gonna go into many details, but just to let you know that relationship there between your animal fats and lymphatic system and the circulatory system. So next time you eat a cheeseburger, just remember, go in your heart soon. It's interesting with the kind of to say evolution or the creation of the development of all these like plant-based meats that especially taste like cow meat, um, Beyond Burger and what's the other big brand? Impossible, right? So you can even get them in the grocery store. A lot of, I've seen a lot of articles um, that people will say, well, they're not any healthier. They're about the same amount of fat and the same amount of calories. So who cares? Well, there's kind of two issues there. One is that they're more sustainable. It's a more sustainable form of protein, meat. So that because they are comparable, it is gonna take a lot more land, water, energy to grow cow, to get that cow burger, the beef burger, as opposed to this plant burger. The other issue is that your body knows better what to do with the plant-based burger than the animal-based burger. So if anybody always says, oh, no, no, they're not, it's not any healthier, it's healthier for the earth and as well as it is healthier for yourself. So calorie-wise, you still need to kind of watch that so that if you're like, I'm gonna go to Burger King and get a double impossible burger, maybe you only want a single because it's still a lot of calories. So health-wise and calories, watch that, but a better choice in the long run. Okay, so back to the veins. So from the lymphatic vessels to the veins, to the vena cavas, which dump right into your right atrium. And then those just flow around your heart, those little fats. All right, so let's talk about the third function. The third function has a relationship with the immune system. Because one of the things a doctor, if you go for a yearly checkup, the doctor's gonna do all kinds of touching of your body. And one thing they're gonna do is they're gonna feel around 
in your neck because your neck has a lot of lymph nodes. Typically in the body, anywhere where you have, I like to call them portals to the outside world, you're going to have more lymph nodes there, meaning you're gonna have these kind of blown up areas that are gonna have a lot more white blood cells in there because you have a lot more contact with the outside world, which means that there is a lot more incidences that can happen with infections. So around your ears, you're gonna have more lymph nodes, right? Around your ears, nose, eyes, mouth. You have a lot more portals to the outside world. Around your, for women, the breasts, underarms where you're sweating, your pores are open a lot more, and your urogenital system. So you have an increased amount of lymph nodes in those areas. Targeting the main invaders, and we're gonna talk about other invaders and just kind of in general. Things that are not great threats to our body, but can cause us to have immune response like right now, my allergies for, it keeps going on. Two weeks ago, they were bad. Last week, they were fine. This week, they're bad again. So allergies is another one. Just pollen, right? What is our, probably, it's probably mold actually this time of year. Um, so the mold, which is not going to kill me, but my body is like, let's get rid of this. You react to this. You're gonna have immune responses. So I've got a lot of exhaustion these last few weeks. Um, so in addition to bacteria and viruses, could be, and we're gonna talk about other parts of our immune system, but anything that might get in your body, anything that your body has just been conditioned to wanna to fight off, like allergy issues, you're gonna have more lymph nodes in the areas that those things can enter your body. Lymphocytes, type of white blood cell, are gonna be found in increased amounts in your lymph nodes. So again, anywhere you have portals to the outside world, you're gonna have a higher amount. The tonsils inside the back of your throat, you've got a lot there, because right, nose and mouth and eyes and sinuses, so your ears, your eyes, your nose, your mouth all drain into the back of your mouth. So that's why you have those big tonsil areas. If you've gotten infections of your tonsils regularly from streptococcus, specific kinds, you might have had to get them out. The thymus and the spleen also help assist the lymphatic system to produce more lymphocytes the thymus produces a lot, and then the thymus, when you're young, it starts to kind of deteriorate away. So it's nice to have all these helpers for our immune system, because our immune system, while it's less than 1% of your blood cells, it does a lot, and it's really important. So kind of amazing in that way. We're going to learn that there are many different kinds of white blood cells. White blood cells that eat up cells that have been marked, or tissues that have been marked, by other cells in your immune system. They're called macrophages. Anytime you have a phage, it's something that eats. And so we have these larger white blood cells, macrophage, they're going to eat up cells that have been marked for destruction by white blood cells in your body, by other white blood cells. So some issues like the mumps, we get a vaccine for that, the MMR vaccine has been nearly eradicated with a lot of misinformation and the emergence of a lot of anti-vaxxers in the world, especially in the United States, we're seeing these pockets of mumps pop up here and there every so often. Tonsillitis, this is, I've had this. When you get infection of that, not exactly sure why, but susceptibility to that streptococcus specific strain. All right, and the last one, last function of the lymphatic system 
is to filter the blood of dead red blood cells. If you have 2 million red blood cells produced and die every second, somebody's got to get those dead red blood cells out to clear out the way for new red blood cells. So we have this filtration system. The spleen is the main filtration of that. However, if you have like a car accident and your spleen gets damaged, you can still, there's other ways, like the kidneys will help to make up for the filtration of those dead blood cells. All right, last thing to note. I think that's one. You guys have one? We do not.